Um, when I got out of college, you know, and when I got the, the job at the production pottery, I had some decent skills. This is a classic early years, although I consider myself still very much in my early years now. Um, having just quit my job a couple of years ago, I consider the last couple of years really the foundational years of my career as a ceramic artist. But this mug, you know, very simple to throw, uh, round. Um, you know, it's, you see a lot of early potters, young potters, making this style of mug. It's got a, a really easy shape to make. And then, I, you know, just experimenting with a few design motifs. Um, but this, this is, you know, I don't have a good record of my pots pre-production pottery. Um, but this is a mug that's already been influenced and helped along by, uh, you know, probably two, three years of throwing production pots. Um, here's a tea, an old teapot and cup. And this is a chino glaze, a carbon trap chino. And in these early years, I used a gas kiln to finish my work. And you've had some other living potters here, some of them making pots for many, many more years than I have. Um, but gas, I fired to, in pottery speak, cone 10, gas reduction, meaning fired to about 2350 in terms of temperature and reducing the, the oxygen in the kiln. Um, this particular glaze gets a smoky look because it actually traps excess carbon. Um, and that's where the blacks come from. But still very, very early, early pots. Um, this pot, you know, I'm always, I make a lot of teapots and a lot of pitchers. Here's an early pitcher. Um, I remember being really excited about this pot. It, yeah, it's got some neat things going on. The glaze turned out really nice. I liked the handle. Um, the balance was a little off with the foot. But, you know, these two, these two things and then these jugs, um, kind of a dark slide here, but these jugs, and you'll see this throughout a lot of these slides, I'll uh, kind of point this out. This, these are directly based off of that jug. I mean, that, I got that jug and I thought, I'm gonna make some of these in clay. I'm just gonna go and be, and the first ones I made were just directly inspired by it. I made them, I made reproductions of them, basically. Um, again, um, is there any way to kick the... Okay. Okay, darker slides like that. Yeah. Okay, here's a, here's a bowl. Um, you know, it's got, it's, again, round, simple. It's got some nice things going on, but fairly simple. Basically me um, using some of my early skills, to, you know, and then uh, just adding some design and textural things to them. Um, this is a, this picture here, actually the University of Bemidji purchased this picture. Um, so it's in their permanent collection. I don't know what they do with their permanent collection. It's probably in a storeroom somewhere. Um, this, this, <laughs> this picture kind of is a good example of one of my first sort of series of work. Uh, the, I call them belted pots because they've got the sort of the round bottom, the tall top, and then that belt going around them. Um, so this is the first kind of first time that I settled into uh, kind of a body of work, you know. And that's a term that a lot of artists use, a lot of potters use, a body of work. Um, again, here's another one, a little a little extra design on the, on the belt there. Early on, and this happens with a lot of people. It's just kind of like a scatter gun. You go through, you're like, oh, I'm going to make this mug and I'm going to make this cup, and they're all different. And the, you know, the early stuff always, in retrospect, seems so scattered. It doesn't have a middle to it where you kind of rotate around. It's just like, oh, I saw this. I'm going to make that. I'm going to make this. Uh, and this, these here pots, kind of are are good examples of, you know, it'd be like Picasso's blue period or something. These are my belted period. Nice that I can compare myself to Picasso, huh? <laughs> Sl slip that one in, no one knows. Do they come apart? They don't. They're all thrown in one piece. Um, the, the middle is just uh, like a texture, a little a couple of lines. Uh, one thing that is, is always present, though, as I'm sort of learning and growing um, throughout my belted series, and even before, is my attention to the form. I'm very interested in crisp lines sort of unbroken curves, 
Um, you know, and here's this, here's the series of them. And I really enjoyed these pots. Uh, you can see my early signature down at the bottom too. Three little lines and I kind of designated as my signature. Couldn't read anything. So that, you know, if you see early pots, early belted pots out there, there are a few. That's how you would design, that's how you could date my work, I guess, um, with those three little dashes. Um, here's an early, and these were fairly successful pots. I was, pretty, I was pretty happy with some of these pots. Early pouring vessel. Again, I, you know, I make a lot of pouring vessels, a lot of pitchers. They all kind of rotate around the idea of, you know, pouring, obviously. But, you know, in, in, in hindsight, you know, did my mom's dominance of yeah. pitchers in the house influence that? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, the, tall, the tall jug definitely did. I did. I've always liked tall forms, tall skinny cylinders. Here's another sort of jug form that came off of this, this jug here, and then again, belted cups. Um, there's a little more of a straightforward jug. And I've got a ton of these sitting around the house because I loved making them, but people really didn't love going home with them. So these ones especially. This is an in-process shot here. Um, this, is, this is sort of uh, inspired by another jug that my dad gave me for Christmas one year. It had this really neat line in the middle. And I don't know if that would have been a, like a mold line where the two halves came off or something but it was a neat kind of split. And so I made this series, um, sent them out to galleries, brought them to shows, brought them all home. And, and I'm now just giving them to my family uh, for, for presents. Here's another, and these are all high fire pots here still. So these are all still out of the studio at the production pottery that I was working at. Um, this is just kind of a standard mug again. You know, I did the belted thing for a long time and then you can see like, all of a sudden I'm doing, I'm kind of flashing back to some old ideas. And here the stamp shows up for the first time. That stamp is now my signature and it's on everything I've made unless I forgot to stamp it, which typically then I either throw it away or keep it for myself. Um, this, what does that stamp mean? Um, it doesn't mean anything um, on its own. It was just a dowel that I, I wanted. I was like, I want to start stamping this stamp in this pot. It was a teapot specifically that I was working on and I thought, well, this needs some stamping decoration. So I grabbed a dowel, cut it down, sanded it and filed it until I had this, you know, very simple design. And um, so in itself, it doesn't mean anything, but throughout using it, it comes to represent me. So, you know, meaning through use. Here's a pseudo belted pot. It's kind of hard to see the, the green, the dark, on the dark background there. No longer has the belt. It's lost the belt for a more of a slimming look, I guess. Um, and, and here's another pot here. This green glaze has um, been a hallmark of my work for a long time. I started using this turquoise blue and when I switched firings, I had to recreate it. Um, and I've come out with some fairly, something, you know, fairly close. One of the things that the, this, I've started to, a lot of potters will stamp their work. And I use my stamp, and not to say this is totally unique. There's a lot of, some potters do this also, even more in more bold ways than I do. But I often use the stamp as a decorative element. Um, and so here's kind of a middle, middle years pitcher or teapot. Um, so the, the, my stamp is often, there's not like a bottom stamp, there's not an extra signature on the bottom. My stamp is often incorporated into the, the design. Um, and it helps with, I like these large kind of large open areas of satin glazes. And then these small little, you know, dots and, and, and details. I didn't see it right away, but um, Somebody said, oh, wow, that looks like a window. That little stamp looks like a window. Uh, and, and so this is kind of a, an example of, you know, being inspired by somebody else's perceptions of, of the work. So I thought, oh, wow, that's cool. A window, huh? So maybe there's, it started making me think about architectural elements. Um, this slide's actually a little bit of, out of order here, but 
nice with the two, the two teapots and the two handles there. Um, so I started carving extra little areas into the pot to kind of kind of play on that idea of architecturalness of doorways, of windows. Um, but one of the things that really happened was that um, I started faceting. We call it faceting. I don't know if it's a term that's used for art pottery when there's, face, there's faces to the pots like that. Um, but these pots are thrown fairly heavy, thick walled. And then for this scenario here, I would take a wire and like a, like a slice of cheese, take it and slice off in kind of a, in, in that directional way and then move the wire to get those sort of texture elements towards the bottom and the middle. And these instantly started to look like lighthouses. I mean, the minute I stamped it, it was like, wow, that's a lighthouse. Yeah. So it was really interesting how that stamp could control the perception of what this pot might mean or what it, what it might say. So the, the architectural aspect um, quickly became something that I was thinking about, but not necessarily you know, pushing or like, oh, I'm going to make pots that look like houses. I'm going to make pots that talk about How scale. Tall is that previous one? The previous one is probably about 12 inches. Um, I made those as tall as probably 14, 15 inches. Is, the, is that a lid on the top or is it cut? There's a lid uh, about three inches down. What do you see? Where it, does it open? It's a full piece and it has a very small opening at the top. Okay. So, oh, so it, would be, it would be thrown on the wheel, really heavy. I would finish out the top somewhat, cut it, and then finish it. And, so, and then add, add little handles to it. These pots were a lot of fun too. Again, not terribly, you know, um, effective at the art shows and stuff. Which is, which is never why I make the pots I make. But you can't just keep making pots for the sake of like, oh, I love this pot, and now I have 300 of them at home. Um, but they're all sort of leading somewhere, and you know, they've led me in an interesting to an interesting place now, and I hope you know that they continue to lead me. Another thing that was happening here between these kind of pots, very tight, very, uh, you know, every, the lines are very controlled. Everything was feeling, was feeling kind of boxed in by control. So between the texture and the sort of looseness, I was, I was, it was a conscious effort to be like, all right, I got to loosen up. I want my pots to still maintain a very tight feeling, but have a little bit of spontaneity and looseness. And that balance is still something I think about a lot. Like, all right, I like to I like work that's finished and completed and has very tight design elements, but I like a little bit of looseness and playfulness um, in the work as well. Another way to date the work is the, the stamps here are just used as stamps. They're not filled with glaze. Um, that doesn't start happening until later. And then there, so most of the high fire work that I did is, is the stamps don't get a glaze fill. These are in process. These are just pots that have recently been trimmed, finished. Um, and these were round pots that got kind of squared off, um, but still remain fairly round. Uh, here is a, kind of not an early uh, electric fired pot, but you can see there's glaze fill in the stamp. It's dark. Um, these pots, instead of getting cut with a wire, now I use a, a rasp, it's a sure-form rasp. It's basically like a cheese grater. It's typically a woodworking tool. A lot of potters use them. Um, and you can see some of the lines that it creates. If you think about like the smaller, et, the smaller size on a, on a cheese grater, and you draw that through the semi-wet clay and it just peels clay off. So I'm still throwing very thick forms, but here now I've got a whole no another level of texture and control and I no longer cut with the wire. For a couple of reasons, I never really enjoyed the process of cutting through pots with a wire. It was sort of tedious and you cut through every, one, every like fifth one and have to throw it away. I really enjoy the process of shaving them down with the, uh, the rasp. This is a teapot that is probably a year and a half old now. Um, this will be in the 500 Teapots book by Lark. They put out the 500 series. Um, the, it's hard to tell from the image, but this was this actually kind of has a diamond-shaped uh, shape to it. And then, you know, I, for a little while, I was carving some little 
sort of landscape and feather motifs into the pots. And I'll do that again, but I kind of go back and forth. I'll do something for a while and I'll back off and do something new. And then I'll go back to that and be like, well, you know, that really worked for that pot. I need that here. So I'll bring those sort of elements in. Here's another, here's a kind of similar to those, the, the sort of uh, lighthouse pot, um, but this is with the, the rasp, those lines are created, and you can kind of see the sort of striation marks, those lines, uh, and that's very typical of my pots now. The rasp and the pot. So I kind of hold it in my lap and move it like this. Okay. So I'll go through and I'll just do rough marks and then I'll continue, I'll, I'll do it over and over, round and round and round and round until I get the shape. This, this shape, this time around, I went back to this because I was sitting on my back steps. I mean, the, the, the earlier lighthouse pot was probably 2009, 2000, you know, somewhere in there, 2010. Um, I was sitting on my back steps reading and I looked over and we've got the morning glories that grow up our, one of our back uh, railings for our stairs and when they're closed they're just this perfect spiral they're just twisted and i looked at it and i was like wow that's cool i should do that again and so i went and did it again but only on like three pictures and then i stopped so you know when i'm moving through pots and thinking about um what i want to do next sometimes i'll play into an idea and it'll be done and i'll make three or four and that's it and i'm moving on and it, you know, in total, it's sort of a refinement of the body of work in total, but that is just sort of like a little sketch. I do it three or four times. I learn a few things from it, what I like, what I don't, and maybe I go back to it, maybe I don't. This is a very, pretty recent pot here. This is probably last, this is probably 2000, this is a 2012 picture for sure. And this is kind of the culmination of a lot of the working on pictures over the years. It, it, you know, brings together my interest in tall cylinder forms. Um, it's a round pot. It's not squared off like a lot of my pots, but I bring in, I've now brought in these new squared little carvings. I carve out those little squares on the body of the pot, fill them with glaze. Then I wax them off and then finish the other piece so that that area doesn't get extra glaze. It's, I've created a very tedious glazing process for myself. Um, one of the things that I, I heard a number of years ago, I was watching one of the, the um, PBS specials on Craft in America. There was a, a textile artist, and one of his comments was, I don't ever do anything because I think, or I don't ever not do something because I think it's going to take a long time. So I, I try never to be like, oh, you know, I could do that, but it, man, that's going to add a lot of labor. And, cause that, and it's such a simple idea, and that when he said that, it really sort of cemented a lot of the things that I'd already kind of known, and he just kind of summarized it in a, in a great line. And I just feel that if you ever, if I ever stop something because ah, it's just going to take too long, I'm basically just shutting off an, a road to explore. Um, so here's another picture. This is thrown without a base and altered and then and then textured and, sco and carved into. Um, so again, another pitcher, another pouring vessel, kind of an, another exploration of that form. Here's another pouring vessel. I've, I've got one, I brought one similar. It's kind of the culmination of, of this shape. This is kind of where the jug is, has ended up. Um, and I don't go home with many of these anymore, so. It's, it's nice to have, there's a nice slide. Well, a nice projection, I should say. Uh, another, another one of these um, pouring vessels where everything has kind of come together, I feel, at this point, you know, and I'm still working on it, I'm still changing them. But the jug form is still there with that little top knot and that tall kind of, uh, you know, drafting form. And it's got the handle still, and then the spout is the addition that kind of brings it to the, to the pouring vessel. Um, a mug, just, you know, mugs, potters make a ton of mugs. Some potters hate them. I love making mugs. I love the challenge of, you've got this design space. You know, you can make a pitcher that's six inches tall. You can make a pitcher that's two feet tall. I mean, you can make a plate that's for tea or a plate that's supposed to hang in a giant wall. 
but mugs, you can't make a two foot tall mug. It doesn't make sense. You know, visually it might make sense, but I don't, you know, so you've got this space you've got to work in and it's, you know, between, depending on who you are, some people like their four ounce, you know, espressos and some people like their 28 ounce super gulps, but it gives you a confined space to work in and I always kind of like that challenge. Like I've got these small areas to work in. How do I fit in something interesting to the design? How do I work within that space? And, and, and keep myself engaged in it um, so I can make more. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things that um, I also enjoy doing is making pots in pairs or in groups, um, taking two cups and making them similar but different, and then glazing them together. Uh, and I really enjoy making cups and saucers. Um, and this slide here is an example of kind of the, really the next step in where I'm heading is making these sort of set pieces. So these mugs, this is, uh, the mugs are thrown, altered, carved, finished, very, you know, typically like everything else. Um, then the base is just slab work. I'm, I'm rolling slabs and I'm seaming them together and they're very heavy like the pots before I carve into them. And I'm carving it down with the rasping tool and carving into it to create textures that reflect the pots that are going to sit on them. So I like to think of these like, you know, these two mugs that are, their buddies, and this is their little home. You know, this is where they go after work. Like, hey, and they're different. You know, the mugs are different heights, and the the base has a little bit of a awkward, not awkward, but it's not symmetrical in the design. This is, again, this kind of what I've been doing lately with work is, and this is, there's always something new that's going on and it always takes way more time than what I was doing before. So this would be a round pot and I've got an example of one of these. Um, and this is a 2013 pot. Um, that la those last mugs were probably last, just at the end of last year, but this is kind of the freshest, newest work here. This was a round pot that I threw in the wheel without a base, take it off the wheel, make it into an oval, still very elastic work, then it sets up. Then I cut it in half. Well, not in half, in thirds. So now I've got two pots that are like dissected and I've got to figure out how to reconstruct them. So I add slabs for the sides. I add a slab for each base. And then they're, they're still very thick. I've done this all sort of crudely. They, they don't look all that nice sitting there. They're just kind of these, I call them blanks. Like I'm throwing mug blanks today, I'm throwing teapot blanks today, I'm throwing these sort of general forms that look like, oh, you just started out, you know, oh, you're new to this, huh? And so then I take the rasp and I rasp and I carve and I kind of pull the form out of it. Um, this is a vase, two-piece vase, which was a similar scenario, thrown, oval, I kind of seam the top shut, uh, add slabs on the sides to finish it after I cut it in half again, um, and then again, carving and, and rasping. Where does the base open? The two little indents? Oh, that's the open. Those are the open, open areas. So I seam it shut and then cut that out. And then as I'm glazing, I'm thinking, all right, how do I unite these two pieces together again? So I glaze to try to create, like with that piece and that piece, I try to create these focal points. Oh, that's a square. Oh, but that's two pieces. But my eye sees that square as one, and here I'm trying to create that visual connection between the two pieces with that square. This is a teapot. This is kind of my just everyday Joe teapot. I've got one of these at home. Um, you know, if I make a pot of tea, this is what it goes in. And squared, rasps, you know, just kind of a standard everyday teapot. Here is Again, that, that idea of making a pot and then giving it some place to exist. And it's got that base which has been carved and shaved and, and slab built. And that teapot has been squared out and, and formed after kind of a, a hunkish throwing. Um, 
And this is another example of that. The, I'll, I'm going to go through a little process piece here quick and then kind of sum it up. But there's, there's some fuzziness, and I'll get into a little bit of geek, glaze geek here. There's some kind of fuzziness you see on the, on the pot. And one of the things that I do, and it's a very, it's, Ernest does it. Ernest is a great potter. You're going to meet him in a couple weeks. My studio mate, Matt, does it. We all, we fire, for the most part, in our studios, in town, in electric kilns. Basically, they're like giant toaster ovens. And you turn your toaster oven on, and those elements glow, and your toast toasts. It gets to 350 degrees. Except ours have way more insulation. The elements are way bigger, and they get way hotter. But they just, they basically look like giant garbage cans with lids on them. And we do everything in it finished to start. So it's, it's, it's sort of the urban potter way to do your work, where you live in town, you don't have a kiln that's outside of town where you transport your pots to, um, and there's a lot of great opportunities that the electric kiln gives you. It gives you full control of the heat in the kiln. I can tell my kiln, you know, go 50 degrees to 150 degrees an hour, hold there for 20 minutes, then rise 500 degrees. I mean, I can tell it, and then stop for 15 here, and then ramp down, you know, 50 degrees to 1750. I can tell it what to do, and that allows me to do certain things with the, the chemistry in the glaze. That, it, those are small crystals that are forming, and when you see Ernest's work in a couple of weeks, he grows large crystals in, in his crystal and glazing. But it, and he'll know way better than I do about how that happens and even about how this happens. But this happens after the kiln reaches its mature temperature of about 2100, 2150. I crash cool it to 1750 and then slowly cool it to 1600 degrees, hold it for a half an hour, and then it cools normally. Well, if I didn't do that, those crystals wouldn't have that time to grow and form. Um, beyond like how that happens, I don't understand the chemistry of it. I don't know, but it's a, you're gr basically you're growing crystals at this time where zinc wants to do a certain thing. Ask uh, ask Ernest how do you grow crystals, and the chemistry of it. He might know, or he'll stump him. So this is just a quick. Um, run through on the, the process of one of the most recent pots I'm doing. I've got kind of an example here. I've already thrown this. I should have taken some photos earlier in this. I've already thrown this, shaved it down, and oviled it, and I've cut it in half there. You can see it better here. So that's cut in half, and then I kind of, there's, there's one half, and I lop the top off of that half, and that top just gets tossed. Um, so there's the short half on the left where I cut the top off. The tall half on the right, I add a slab to that, um, and then I connect them. So this goes boop. <laughs> um, I wish it was that quick in the studio. <laughs> but and you can kind of see there's those rough edges and stuff there. And later I'll smooth that in and I'll reef, I'll finish it out. And you can see that that rough edge has disappeared. Uh, I kind of smash it down and then I use that tool. It's just, it's just a great tool to be able to control those, those planes. Uh, this doesn't have a bottom yet, and the top, I cut the top, uh, and then sort of shave that down and fit it. So it's kind of like, okay, I cut the top, check it, put it back on, check it. Um, so there's a lot of back and forth with that, and then I add a handle. And so this is the finished piece here, with the, with the base put on it, and then the top, and the handle, uh, and then the stamp, and sort of some rough edges. And this isn't the same one. This is the one I actually brought. But that's an example of that finished kind of a piece. And then just the last few here, you can kind of see the difference between the early years, I guess you could call them, um, and my most recent work. There's an early mug and a much more developed later style mug. There's that picture. And now, I mean, they, they have a lot of, they still have that similar S curve, still have that sort of like, here's where the, the top starts. Um, this is a neat combination here. Early pouring vessel, late pouring vessel, but similar motifs throughout. Those little decorative areas, the way I'm trying to figure out the dimensions and the, and the proportions of the top where you've got all these things crowded together and how to balance that with the body. Um, and there's that piece for some reason. So <laughs> that's it.